Electrocardiography has grown a lot since the invention of the first practical electrocardiograph by Willem Eindhoven in 1903. The initial devices were very large and one had to immerse three limbs in jars filled with salt water in order to get ECG recorded. Now the devices have been miniaturized with the help of new generation electronic circuits so that even small handheld devices can record ECG. ECG monitoring has become commonplace in all emergency departments, intensive care units and operation theatres. ECG records the electrical activity of the heart. The electrical activity of the heart normally originates in the sinoatrial node situated in the right upper part of the right atrium and gets conducted down sequentially to reach the ventricles. Conduction from the SA node to the next relay station known as the atrioventricular node in the lower part of the right atrium is through internodal pathways which are specialized conduction tissue in the right atrium. One of the internodal pathways has a branch to the left atrium through which conduction occurs simultaneously to the left atrium that is Bachmann's bundle. In the AV node, there is a short delay for the impulse transmission after which it reaches the bundle of His for onward conduction to the ventricles. Bundle of His has two divisions, right and left bundle branches meant for the two ventricles. Left bundle branch has two subdivisions, anterior and posterior, and sometimes a third septal branch. These subdivisions are known as fascicles. From the fascicles, conduction reaches the ventricular muscles through a branching system of Purkinje fibers. Fascicles and Purkinje fibers have not been illustrated in the figure. ECG is commonly recorded using electrodes attached to various parts of the body surface. If recordings are taken with electrodes kept within the heart, it is known as intracardiac electrogram, which is done during invasive electrophysiology study inside the electrophysiology laboratory. ECG uses four limb electrodes on each of the four limbs of which the electrode on the right leg is considered electrically neutral while the other three are active electrodes. In addition to this, six electrodes are placed on specifically designated parts of the chest to get chest lead recordings. Though there are only 10 electrodes which are used for recording a usual ECG, various electrode combinations can be recorded with these electrodes so that most common recording is a 12 lead ECG. Number of leads may be increased using additional electrodes in specific situations. Waves noted in a normal ECG are called P wave, QRS complex, T wave and sometimes a U wave. Other waves which can be rarely seen are delta waves and epsilon waves. P wave represents the depolarization of the atria while QRS complex represents the depolarization of the ventricles. T wave is due to repolarization of the ventricles. PR segment is between the P wave and the QRS complex while the ST segment is between the QRS complex and the T wave. TP segment is between the T wave and the next P wave. TP segment is considered as the true baseline in the ECG. Intervals contain one or more waves and a segment. 
PR interval contains the P wave is measured from the onset of P wave to the onset of the QRS complex. QT interval contains the QRS complex as T segment and the T wave. It is measured from the onset of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. PP interval is measured from the onset of one P wave to the onset of the next P wave. RR interval is measured from the onset of one QRS complex to the onset of the next QRS complex or as the interval between the peaks of two consecutive R waves for simplicity. Delta waves occur at the onset of the QRS complex and epsilon waves are seen at the end of the QRS complex in certain pathological conditions. A prominent U wave after the T wave can be seen in hypokalemia. An initial negative deflection which is part of the QRS complex is called Q wave. An initial positive deflection is named R wave. A second negative deflection or a negative deflection following an R wave is called S wave. A second positive deflection will be termed R prime wave. If there is a negative deflection after the R prime, it is called S prime wave. Waves less than 5 mm amplitude may be designated by small letters. Recording a good ECG is the first step in getting a good diagnosis using it. If the recording is technically incorrect, interpretation can go wrong. First and foremost is to place the electrodes correctly in the recommended positions. Some knowledge of human surface anatomy is required for accurate placement of electrodes. Skin electrode contact should be good for transferring the microvolt range of potentials accurately from the body to the ECG machine. If the skin is too hairy, it may be worthwhile shaving the area before applying the electrode gel. Limb electrodes are usually attached using clips to the distal region of each limb. Chest electrodes are attached using suction cups attached to compressible rubber spheres. In case there is difficulty in attaching chest leads by suction, one can remove the suction cups and stick the bare electrodes to the designated parts of the chest using adhesive tapes. This method may have to be resorted to in small children and infants mostly because there may not be enough space on the chest to keep all the six electrodes. Sometimes this technique has to be used for limb electrodes when the distal part of the limb is covered by surgical dressing. In that case, the electrode is attached just proximal to the dressing using adhesive tapes. Avoiding interferences from nearby electrically operated devices is often a challenge while recording ECG in the intensive care setting. ECG monitoring leads attached to the patient may have to be temporarily removed to prevent artifacts due to alternating current picked up from these leads. Power cords of electrically operated beds pneumatic compression devices, infusion pumps and other electrically operated devices in close vicinity may also have to be removed from power sockets to reduce electromagnetic interference from AC line. AC interference is seen as a symmetrical sine wave pattern in the baseline at the frequency of the line voltage in the vicinity. It can be either 50 Hz or 60 Hz depending on the line voltage frequency in the locality. In most modern ECG machines, notch filters are used to suppress AC interference. In spite of this, AC interference may still appear in the recorded tracings if the interference is strong. In this ECG, AC interference is best noted in leads 1 and lead 3. Equally important is avoiding interference from muscle activity electromyogram or EMG artifacts. If patient is restless or anxious, a good explanation of the procedure and pacification often helps. Warming the patient with a warmer or a blanket may be needed if shivering due to the cold atmosphere is noted. Sometimes we may have to switch off the air conditioner temporarily to make the person comfortable, especially in the intensive care unit or post-operative ward. Trauma in diseases like Parkinson's disease can also be troublesome. Sometimes coarse tremors produce artifacts resembling ventricular tachycardia. 
fine trauma artifacts can even resemble ventricular fibrillation. This is more likely to be confusing while monitoring ECG in the intensive care setting, especially if the lead being monitored has low amplitude of QRS complexes. Artifacts may be severe enough to mask the low voltage QRS complexes and lead to wrong interpretation. In this ECG, V1 shows multiple small artifacts almost totally obscuring the small QRS complexes so that at one look it mimics ventricular fibrillation. Close scrutiny with comparison with other leads enables recognition of QRS complexes within the artifacts by their timing with other QRX complexes simultaneously recorded in leads like V3 where the amplitude of the artifacts is much lower than that of the QRS complexes. In V2, certain artifacts resemble a wide QRS tachycardia. The fact that it has not affected the regular QRS rhythm in other simultaneously recorded leads indicate that these are artifacts and not a run of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This also illustrates the advantage of monitoring multiple leads simultaneously while observing for arrhythmias. In this case, a single lead V1 monitoring could lead to initiation of CPR if one is not vigilant enough to follow the regular pre-CPR sequence for identification of cardiac arrest before initiating chest compressions. Similarly, monitoring of V2 could lead to an inappropriate shock external DC shock being delivered. This ECG shows artifacts due to trauma resembling a ventricular tachycardia. The upper panel shows artifacts resembling a wide QRS tachycardia and the lower panel shows the ECG with same leads when the tremor was not severe. The spikes of the QRS complexes marked by blue arrows can be seen at regular intervals even when the trauma artifacts are strong. Similar artifacts can sometimes be seen on the cardiac monitor during chest physiotherapy due to the movement artifacts picked up by the chest electrodes. Occasionally, unilateral tremor may produce artifacts only in leads involving that particular lip while it may be absent in other ECG leads. Artifacts resembling wide QRS tachycardia can lead on to inappropriate shocks in an ICU setting. This can be avoided by physically checking the pulse every time an arrhythmia is detected and therapy planned. In small children, sedation may often be required before recording ECG as they are sometimes anxious about the leads being connected. Alternate method is recording an ECG during natural sleep. ECG machines have a high pass filter which passes frequencies above it and a low pass filter which passes frequencies below it to the ECG amplifier. Low pass filter is meant for filtering out high frequency interferences like muscle artifacts and high pass filter for respiratory fluctuation in baseline. In addition, there is a notch filter for line voltage usually set at 50 or 60 Hz depending on the frequency of the alternating current in the locality. When the notch filter is disabled, Alternating current interference will become prominent and baseline becomes very wide with 50 Hz sine wave interference as shown above. Usually for reducing artifacts, default setting of filters is 0.08 to 40 Hz. When a permanent pacemaker has been implanted, too low setting of low pass filter can make the pacing artifacts almost invisible. Low pass filter has to be kept above 100 Hertz, typically 150 Hertz to make the pacing spikes evident as shown below. In an emergency setting, when it is not known that the patient has a pacemaker in situ, ECG taken with default low pass filter setting of 40 Hertz is likely to be mistaken as a left bundle branch block as right ventricular pacing gives a left bundle branch block pattern on the ECG. In modern day digital ECGs, filter settings can beautify the tracings but vital information can be filtered out as in this case which is quite common. In the illustration, 0 0.08 Hz is the high pass filter meaning that the ECG amplifier passes all frequencies above that limit. 40 Hz 
is the low pass filter indicating that all frequencies below that can pass through. Pacemaker spike also called pacemaker artifact or pacemaker stimulus being a high frequency signal is effectively filtered out by the above filter setting. Hence the above ECG is likely to be diagnosed as left bundle branch block at one look. Though we are missing the P waves before each QRS complex which would be expected in a simple LBBB with sinus rhythm. The pacemaker spikes are easily seen when the same ECG is repeated with a change in the low pass filter to 150 Hz. In fact, both atrial and ventricular pacing spikes markers in AVF are seen before each QRS complex with an interval in between. Hence, this person has a functioning dual chamber pacemaker in situ. The paced P waves are of low amplitude and hardly visible or it could be lack of an atrial response to atrial pacing or atrial capture failure.